Уважаемые, уважаемые коллеги, разрешите открыть очередное заседание нашей школы. И сегодняшняя школа будет проходить в несколько ином формате. Это новый для нас формат, поэтому нам очень интересно потом будет услышать ваше мнение о вот таком несколько необычном для нас, для нас форме работы нашей школы, отечественной школы онкологов. И сегодняшнее заседание посвящено инновациям в лечении немелкоклеточного рака легкого в 2020 году. И в работе школы согласился принять участие Тони Мок, профессор Мок из Гонконга. Профессор Мок обучался в течение 7 лет в Канаде. Затем, вернувшись в Гонконг, он возглавил онкологические отделения в Гонконгском онкологическом центре и в настоящее время является одним из тех, кто определяет вообще политику лечения немелкоклеточного и мелкоклеточного рака легкого в мире. То есть он входит в ряд коллегии многих журналов авторитетных, является членом оргкомитета больших онкологических конференций. И, в общем, это реально выдающийся человек, и поэтому мы очень рады видеть и слышать сегодня Тони Мока. И у меня большая просьба к слушателям не стесняться задавать вопросы. Для этого есть чат. Мы будем их, если нет возможности на английском языке, будем ретранслировать на, с русского на английский. И вот мне кажется, вот эта дискуссия, которая может быть в процессе сегодняшней школы, она, мне кажется, наиболее интересна. И вторым лектором является профессор Моисеенко Федор Владимирович, который нам расскажет о достижениях в иммунотерапии. Иммунотерапия, знаете, быстро развивающаяся и одна из, так сказать, перспективных, наиболее перспективных направлений лекарственного лечения рака. Поэтому, так сказать, мы будем рады услышать и достижения в этой сфере. Первый лектор, профессор Мок, Тони Мок, you can start. Nice to meet you and nice to hear you. I uh, make a short introduction of you. You are a well-known person, not only in China, Hong Kong, uh, United States, but also in Russia. So we, we are glad to, to, to see you and hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Mazenko. I really miss the good time that I have when I was visiting Petersburg, and thank you for your hospitality. I still remember there was a fever in the soccer game in the 2018, and the members still stay. Can I have the share screen, please, to the organizer? All right, let me just share, share my screen. Okay. So it is great pleasure of trying to meeting you all, you know, in this difficult time virtually. Uh, certainly, I look forward to coming back for another visit in the near future. So today is just kind of the first, the second month of 2020, 21. And I would like to go through with you about the breakthrough in the past year, plus a little bit of 2021 uh, in terms of molecular target therapy. So most of this information I get it from different journals and also the major conferences. I'm sure that you're exposed to most of it, but I try to put them together as a package and also try to share my insight one at a time. Started with number 10 and then I'll count down. Of course, number one is the most important one. And you probably would have guessed which is number one already. Now, number 10 is actually a small study on combine of DGFL TKI and VGFL TKI. Now, you may say that, of course, there's already a lot of combination of DGFL inhibitor and anti angiogenesis. But this study from CTONE from China, CTONE 1706, is on combination of gefitinib and apatinib. This is actually an oral VGFL inhibitor only available in China. It is approved for lung cancer and colorectal and uh, stomach cancer in China and compared to the placebo of gefitinib only. So this is a very typical uh, phase three study and looking at the progression free survival endpoint, 13.7 months versus 10.2 months and the hazard ratio is appropriate at 0 0.7. It's good, but of course we don't have the over survival data as yet. And also this one problem, by adding the oral anti-angiogenesis that there is actually more toxicity, sorry, uh -huh. uh, where more toxicity of diarrhea, hypertension, liver enzyme elevation, you can see there's significant more, you know, in the AG group, in the combination group. Now, the only thing that's convenient is that because the drug is oral compared to itself IV. 
how relevant is it nowadays? Well, I think there's a limitation because right now, um, they, based on the four-hour data, osmotic is already first line. The median progression fee survival is talking about 18 uh, months already. So even though it's an improvement over gefitinib, it does not have too much meaning. So I doubt if that will have a major impact in our management. But there's one interesting point. They also subgroup analysis the patient with the TP53. Small sample size, you know, however, they find that patient with uh, so-called TP53 mutation, that there is actually a better survival outcome of x one a So in a way is that maybe the TP53 may be a selection factor for a future combination with the anti-energenesis. So therefore, I think that, yes, this is a positive study, but it does not add too much, except that it's an oral VGFR TKI. But in the future, I think the only hope is that whether we can look into the TP53 subgroup as a co-mutation. So that is why it's only number 10. Okay, number nine. Well, number nine is actually ADC, uh, uh, so-called the uh, antibody drug conjugate for EGFR TK resistance. Now, uh, TKI resistant is getting a more common problem because our patients survive a lot longer. And this one is called a U31402 by Daisy Sangu. And so you can see that this is the monoclonal antibody target NTHER3. And they do have about eight linker space that link to a very cytotoxic drug, the one of the isomer, the can. And with like a magic bullet, we try to bring the cytotoxic drug inside the cell. Now, this is the earlier data that we reported last year. They reported a response rate of about 25% on 49 patients. And then this kind of happened in the miscellaneous different type, different patient with the different um, so-called uh, mechanism resistance. And then there's an update on the January this year, and the sample size increased 57, and it's still about 25%. However, I can want you, the more mature data will be coming out, and then you have to watch out for that. It was going to come likely in ESCO this year. So watch out for that data. Now, they, they do have some, some durable response there. And also you can see the spider rep, that most of the patients stayed down. And so we don't have the progression-free survival, but we can hope, be hopeful that this can be a durable response. So what does it mean? Well, it means a lot for the patient who are T7i zero M negative. Right now, T7M positive, we have osimertinib, or osimertinib failure patient, or T7M negative failure, we only take chemotherapy. In the future, maybe ADC had the role that target the HER3 expression. So wait and see the more to come this coming year. Number eight. Number eight is going to be a second generation TKI. Well, it's nothing new, but then there is more study coming out. This is an XOR3 study on an electro called ansartinib. They allow patients who are less than one prior chemotherapy, comparing it and sotinib to uh, chrysotinib, a very typical uh, study. And they do have actually shown that whether the patient with just IXC confirmation or IXC and FISH confirmation, they do have positive study of 25 versus 12, has a ratio of 0.5, and the p-value of less than 0.01. So yes, it's positive, And then it is a reasonable drug to for consideration. However, we have to see it in perspective of other second generation GKI. Now, we did have actually an update this year that we uh, on the ADEC study. So we actually published this originally in 2017. You are all aware of it, anatinib versus chrysotinib in the ADEC study. And this year, we actually published it in the journal or uh, annals of oncology. Uh, and then you can see that we were able to define the median progression-free survival to be 34.8 months. Previously, we actually don't, did not reach. And now the chrysotinib is remaining at 10 for nine months and has a ratio is unchanged at 0.43. So this is the update on the situation, but that's not the key point. The key point is the fact that after long-term follow-up, there's no change in toxicity. So after 34 months, mean, meaning that a median of about three years, there's no increase in toxicity and natinib still have a better profile than the chrysotinib. And so I think this is a reassuring that, you know, uh, we actually have a manageable drug. And more importantly, that we actually have a follow-up on the CNS situation. At one year, 2017, we have a CNS non-response rate about 9.4% versus 41.4%. However, you know, uh, when we come to 2020, we didn't have this kind of follow-up data, but then on the patient with CNS, the progression-free rate is about 47% comparing to the CNS with about 30%. So there's 
quite similar, whether you do or you don't have a CNS status in terms of progression free rate. But most important is the fact that on the survival. Now, this is an important information to have. Look at this. At five years, on anatinib, your survival rate is 62.5%, coming to 45%. Now, 62.5, meaning two out of three patients are still alive at five years. We never have that for patients with stage four lung cancer. And now we're actually transforming to the patient, you know, from a deadly disease to some patient who have about 60% chance of being long-term survivor. I think this is an important message to be given to the patient. What does it mean? Well, I think the fact that we have to inform our patient about five survival rate, yes, we got inserted as an additional option, but it does not have a great impact. But I think in the future, we have to look in the g 12 r resistance because there are data suggesting that patients with the started with second generation TKI, they had higher incidence on g 12 r And then we still have to try to find what is the optimal sequence of the TKI. And of course, I will talk to you about the crown data in just a moment. All right, number seven. Now, number seven is to target the exon 20 insertion. Exon 20 insertion is a tough one that we have not been able to target in the past. So the first drug that we have is posvotinib, but more recently in the past year, we have a term mobosetinib, uh, and that is a TAK788 from the Takeda. So they were able to define the dosage about, you know, at about 120 milligram as a standard dosage. And you were able to report initially in the ESMO uh, 2020, the response rate is about 30%. And then we did not have the median progression free survival at that time. But so further on, we actually had WCLC in January of this year. We had an update of a large cohort. First, the cohort with the patient with applied platinum, and also from the exclaim uh, data point, together with you know the, that 96 patient from the exclaim study, and then 86 patient with prior platinum. So looking at the, this two cohort, we were able to demonstrate from exclaim the response rate about 32%, progression-free survival 7.3 months, and you can see the reasonable waterfall port curve. And then for the platinum featured patient, 114 in total, again, response rate about 35%, median progression-free survival 7.3 months. So this is kind of a mixed news message. Yes, you got a reasonable response rate, but it's not high, high response rate. One third may get responded. Progression-free survival, probably better than chemotherapy, but not that much better. So I think it will be a new option, but it will remain to be defined on whether it should be on first line and second line. But there's one problem with this TAK788. That is a diarrhea. So you can see that in both cohort, 90% of patients has some diarrhea. About 20% of them, actually 21 and 16%, have grade 3 diarrhea. Grade 3 diarrhea meaning that you have to be in the bathroom six times or more a day, which prevent you from going to work or going to home, going out. So I think the diarrhea has to be managed before we can popularize the usage of this drug. So what's the impact? Well, first of all, the, the drug is now available in a compassionate program. I, I have used this, this compassionate program, and you may check with your local Takeda people as well that whether you can get this drug. And then FDA had also a designated as a breakthrough therapy designation, meaning that they only the phase two data to get accepted if they find the response rate to be adequate. And also right now in the future, we're looking at the phase three study of single agent mobocertinib versus uh, a standard care of the docetaxel. And then so this trial will be coming along. But the next question is that if the result is only 33% response rate, can we combine with chemotherapy, would the toxicity be manageable? So what, is this the best direction to move forward? I think that remains to be investigated. That is our number seven and coming to number six. Now, number six is ADC for HER2. Now, HER2 is not as uncommon as you think. Now, HER2 is about 3% of the patient. And similar to the previous one, the U1402, we have DS8201 which is called the, um, uh, so and HER2 now. So again, it's a similar thing as a monoclonal antibody against HER2, not HER3. Eight linker coming to a to GCAN, which is the topo TCAN isomerase inhibitor. And you can see that the payload ratio is about eight, which means that one monoclonal antibody, eight cytotoxic drug, make it more potent that way. 
So there are two cohorts. Uh, my uh, one cohort is on the HER2 expression. The other one is on the HER2 mu mutated HER2 uh, cohort. First, let me just try to focus on the HER2 mutated cohort. There are 39 patients reported last year in ESCO by uh, Dr. Um, Erger Smith. And then they actually, on the patient with HER2 mutation, not expression, HER2 mutation, they actually have a high response rate of 62.5%. Very impressive. And then on the median progression free survival of 14 months, and also the not rich in over survival. So I think this is a no brainer in a way is that efficacy on the HER2 mutated population is actually very impressive. However, we have to watch out for one thing, interstitial pneumonitis. Approximately 12% of the patient actually experience some degree of the pneumonitis, mostly grade two and reversible, but that is one worry when we go, when this come to the clinic. Now, the other is that on the HER2 uh, expression positive, reported by Nakagawa in WCLC this year in January. And you can see they had HER2 expression three plus and two plus. And overall, you can see the response rate is only about 20 some percent. Now, mutated 64%, expression 20 to 25%, not as impressive. But then the median duration of a response is reasonable at six months if they do have the response. So that is translated to a median progression free survival of only 5.4 months and then over survival of 11.3 months. So it's really quite different. When I put the two you know, together, that also we are looking into the ILD and you're talking about 16% and there are about 6% of grade five ILD in this particular study. So um, one thing that is actually good from this paper is that they tell us what to look out for. First of all, about the time to onset is about two months, 64 days. Second, most of these IOD are reversible. And how for just one uh, to a patient that cannot recover too well. So putting it together, HER2 mutation, 62, HER2 expression, 24, 14 months for her mutation, 5.4, not rich versus and also 11.3 months, but both has some degree of ILD. So keep this information in mind for your next HER2 mutated positive patient, this is maybe one potential option to look for, especially and HER2 had already been approved for breast cancer and gastric cancer by FDA. So with this approval, I'm quite sure that the HER, the breakthrough therapy destination for lung cancer, HER2 mutation positive is likely going to be in a very positive manner. However, it's less attractive for the HER2 expression. So I think we're waiting for the final phase two data they all come together and then we probably will have approval. But what will be the approach for her to expression? I think quite likely we may have to look into the combination approach in the future, uh, as this is important because a good number of patients, a lot more patients with the her to expression. All right, half the time is gone and I'm half done. Bi specific monoclonal antibody. Now, this is not a new concept. But this is the first time the bispecific monoclonal body for lung cancer had been able to come into some clinical efficacy. This is called amubantamab, which is an anti-EGFL and anti-MAC bispecific antibody. So in other words, this is one uh, antibody that link to both EGFL and MAC. So as a result, they have so-called the combined ligand binding. However, is this the real mechanism action is debatable. There have been some possible uh, mechanism of action is talking about so-called the receptor degradation. What it means is that they actually uh, uh, so-called the bind it uh, to both GF and L and then the receptor becomes degraded. And then as a result, the so-called the uh, immune cell was able to move in and able to uh, so-called the cause the cell death. So this is a another alternative suggested mechanism of action. So the uh, two study, one is called Chrysalis uh, phase one study. And this one, they were able to define the dosage, uh, 1,050 gram for less than 80 kilogram and higher dose of 1,400 milligram for patients who are over 80 milligram. So for this group, they were able to define the so-called the, the dosage and then the outcome on the patient who are actually uh, HER2 positive and then I'm uh, so, sorry, this X120 positive, and then the response rate is about 41%, reported by Kun Chu Park in ESCO. So this is one of the, an other alternative for each of our X120 insertion population. 
Now, and this is also translated in the median progression tree survival about 8.3 and 8.6 months. So amivantinib for EGFR X120 insertion, there are some suggestive data of response rate of 41%. Now, but then another uh, so-called update is actually on the entire group. Now the update on the extension, uh, extension, uh, extension insertion reported just WFCLC 2021, they actually get a both similar response rate, but they got some additional information. It's the fact that they look in a different insertion site. We thought each of insertion is the one disease, but actually it's not. There are multiple insertion sites. They may behave differently. The response rate in the near loop area is higher, 41%, compared to the far loop is about 25%. So in the future, maybe we need to do NGS such that we know the insertion site to decide what is the optimal uh, treatment for this patient. And then again, they do have a reasonable group response and median progression free survival 8.3 month update. And now they get a five over survival 22.8 month, which is not a bad result, okay? And so this is an indicator that we may actually have a potential bicyprus antibody for each of X120. Now, uh, Toxicity-wise, is actually reasonable as compared to uh, Mocosipinib or tax 788 They had less diarrhea. Only 12% of the patient experienced the diarrhea, which make it a competitive edge on the X120 insertion site. Another way to use this drug is on the EGFR mutation positive patient, especially after failing osimertinib. So the another uh, so-called part two, so-called a combination cohort of the uh, Chrysalis study, which was reported ASMO by uh, Dr. Cho in Korea, is to look at amphetamine in combination of lasartinib, which is a Korean make third generation drug for patients who failed the osimertinib. So the group is osimertinib resistant chemo -like group. All right, so what do we get? Well, we got a response rate of 36%, not bad. You know, so in a way is that for patients who failed osimertinib, we only got chemotherapy, but now, uh, you know, instead of chemotherapy, you continue with a third generation TKI plus amivantinib, you have a 36% response rate. And that is actually holds some future for its the development. So I think right now we have demonstrated by specific monoclonal body, maybe, you know, have some clinical efficacy for non small cell lung cancer. For the EGF exon 20, you got response rate 40%. Uh, and then for the patient who failed osimertinib in company with lasartinib, they get a response rate of 36%. And right now they are also submitted for uh, at the approval for the X120 insertion. Now, um, they are actually looking in the future of the a study called Mariposa, which is a phase three study of amivantinib, lasartinib versus osimertinib versus lasartinib as a first line therapy for patients who are EGFL positive. Now, I don't know how smart it is, but then it is being done. First line randomized study compared the uh, amivantinib with chemotherapy plus chemotherapy uh, in the X120 insertion is also ongoing. So the, right now there are two randomized studies, one on X120, one of the EGFM mutation first line. Okay, number four. Number four is going to be MAC-14 skipping, of course. Now MAC-14 skipping is a buzzword this day. Now, just to remind you, MAC X1 uh, 14 skipping uh, is different from a MAC amplification. Focusing for MAC X1 14 skipping, it is a single exon depletion. As a result, they were not able to uh, so called it, uh, that, um, cause their integration or degradation of the MAC. So, therefore, you have continued MAC signal. So, it is a driver oncogene. And then for MAC inhibitor, they got a range of the type 1 and type 2. Type 1, it causes a binding in the ATP pocket uh, in the active stage. And then the uh, type 2 is a cause of binding in the inactive stage. In the inactive stage, there are three drugs, uh, you know, glucetinib, mercetinib, and carbocentinib. You probably know carbocentinib well. However, the toxicity is more, not only because of the binding in the inactive state, but also many of these are actually multi-targeted uh, agents. So for the pure one, we have comatinib, antipotinib, and sulfonitinib. Now, two paper, comatinib and tipotinib in New England Journal article, both in the same month of August. Very impressive. So geometry study is on comatinib, the two cohort. The cohort four is on patient with prior treatment. And then the patient cohort 5B is a patient who are treatment naive. 
and then all had to be mapped excellent volume skipping, skipping 400 BID. Response rate, try treated 41%. Treatment naive, 60%. Now, sample size smaller, 220 patient. Median progression free survival, 5.4 months and 4.4 months. Now that gives you a dilemma. Should you try to treat the map excellent for skipping as a first line or subsequent line? Now, based on this data, it seemed like more reasonable to look to treat it in the first line situation. However, sample size only 28. It may not be able to, for us to come to the uh, definitive conclusion. Uh, but then that would prompt us to say, test the map excellent 14 skipping earlier. And that's also translated into the progression tree survival, as I stated earlier. Now, the important thing, they did not look into just the line of therapy, but rather look at whether liquid biopsy or tissue biopsy. And uh, you can see that the response rate about the same 48 and 50, and it does not really matter whether you use liquid biopsy or solid biopsy, you had the same result. And that also translated into the median progression free survival as approximately 8.5 minutes. So overall, both drugs are, uh, have been approved. The Kamatinib was approved it last year, and then Tepilantinib just approved it a few weeks ago by FDA and make it available for use on MAP, excellent for skipping. Well, I mean, you know, in, in a way, the, the, the so-called the potential impact is that the compassion program is now available in many parts of the world, including Hong Kong. And again, you may want to check with Lovatis, uh, you know, uh, in the Russia to see whether your Kamatinib program is available. And also in the future is the fact that whether we can combine the EGFR TKI and the, this MAP inhibitor for MAP amplification uh, as a part of resistance. So this is nothing to do with MAC 14 skipping. I think uh, unlikely that we can have a randomized study for MAC 14 skipping, but for the large number of patients with MAC amplification, we have to look into the feasibility of a combination study. Okay, coming down to number three now. The number three, of course, is going to be the third generation L, the CRAN study. The CRAN study is on norotinib, 100 milligram versus chrysotinib, very typical design. And then you can see that the hazard ratio is low, 0.28. However, we can never compare hazard ratio from one study to the other, but you can see that this is a rather impressive progression free survival curve, and it's definitely a positive study. But this one important point is because norotinib is actually designed to be a CNF penetrating drug. Is that feasible? Well, you can see that the IC responder is about 81% for norotinib for patients with measurable brain disease. And then the CR rate is 71%, which is actually higher than other TKI. You can see that for anatinib is 81% response rate, but CR rate is 38%. And then brigatinib 78% and 11% of the CR rate. The question is that whether it's important to have CR or PR for the brain. It's debatable. So as long as the tumor is under control, who cares whether it's a CR or PR? It's the duration of control that is actually more important to me. So what does it mean? Well, this is, oh, by the way, this is an OS of about, you know, uh, uh, the, I think the intracranial progression free also look impressive that most of the brain are not dropped, but the duration of follow-up is very short. Toxicity, however, is a concern. Now you can see that hypercholesterolemia is very common, edema, weight gain significantly is quite common, and there's also neuropathy and cognitive dysfunction. About 10% or more may have significant psychosis or depression. So this has to be managed very carefully with norotinib if you're going to choose it as either first line or second line usage. So I think right now that's quite likely that norotinib may become another first line drug for ARK positive lung cancer. And then in US, they may have a higher uptake because they can pay for it. But to me, it's debatable on the sequence because second generation work really quite well. Whether Loratinib may add on extra value, I think there's still some debate or whether it should reserve it for brain metastasis or patient with actually a, um, a, a second line situation. And also we have to manage toxicity carefully and also have the uh, study, the long-term impact of the toxicity. Okay, I'm getting short of breath. Number two. Number two is KRAS G12C, of course. If this is the KRAS, we have not been able to target for a long time, but now we managed to. KRAS in the inactive state, this is the switch, switch one, and then just the GDP control the switch. When the GTP is converted to GTP, the switch is on, the cancer become active. Once you have the mutation that it diminished the GTP hydrolysis, 
therefore the two, the, 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 the gene, uh, I mean, the, the receptor remain in an active state. So therefore the cancer signal continue to grow. That's the concept behind it. And that's why most of the KRAS mutation are very aggressive, whether it's can, lung cancer or pancreatic cancer, they tend to be more aggressive. But then on, we look at the, the, the KRAS, they are a chubby guy. There's no pocket except in this system that at the 12 position, the G12C position that right here, then is a small pocket. So they were able to build a small compound that inhibit this pocket. Now, how common is it in the Asian population? We just published that recently. And then we just find that in Asia is actually rather uncommon. Four, it's only 4.3% of our lung cancer uh, actually harbor this G12C. Uh, don't know whether it was a percentage in Russia, but presumably due to the uh, higher percentage of smoker, I think the G12C is also higher. Usually about one third of all the k reputation is actually a G12C or more. Now, our uh, first drug is the AMG510 in COVID-100, uh, got to 960 milligram as a standard dosage, response rate 32%. Again, good, but not the best. And then that is actually translated in a median progression-free survival of 6.3 months. So, okay, so it is working, but you know, there's a, a, another update of a much bigger population. It is called the COVID-100. Again, just come out in WCLC by Bob, Republic Bob, Bob Lee. And then the response rate on the 121 patient is exactly the same. It's about 33%. So about one third of the patient responded and the median progression-free survival is also the same at 6.8 months. So large cohort already demonstrated. So I think this drug probably will remain as a second line drug due to the response rate. Toxicity, surprisingly, is quite manageable. Uh, actually, there's a uh, some, of some diarrhea, some ART elevation, but generally quite well tolerated as a drug. But one interesting point, as you probably know, STK11 is actually a common commutation of the, of the uh, KRAS. And in that, you find that the patient with actually commutation actually have higher response rate. You can see about 50% response rate if the patient had the STK11 as a commutation to the KRAS. So that's not the only drug. Another drug is called M um, from Marathi, MRT X849. It's called the Adagrepsid, 600 milligram BD. And then they got response at 45%. Now don't compare response rate. I think it's about the same ballpark figure because they have different population. Uh, but certainly this is also translated into a median progression free survival. But interesting point I want to bring out, if they had a commutation as STD11, they also have a high response rate. So it seemed to be, you know, a true phenomenon that world our notice. Well, what's the impact? Well, right now, I think we should start screening for KRAS G12C. Now, sometimes we just report KRAS mutation. We do not go to specific cell type. So maybe it's time to talk to a pathologist and start to collect the, uh, the patient with the G12C. And then I'm quite sure there's a phase three study comparing Dorsitexo as a second line therapy is ongoing. In the future, we're going to look into STG11 as cobalt marker. All right, last but not the least, I'm over my time a little bit. Of course, the number one that you would have guessed is Adora study, adjuvant EFL TKI. Patient with the resectable stage 1B, 2, and 3, EGF mutation positive, randomized to osomentinib or placebo. They may or may not have chemotherapy prior to randomization. Huge has a ratio 0 0.17, 0 0.12 for stage 3, and 0 0.5 for stage 1B. So the primary endpoint is a stage 2B and 3 and that uh, has a ratio of 0.17. So overall, this is a very positive study in terms of progression-free survival. However, the over survival is hugely immature. I think it would take three to five years before we got any kind of over survival data. Now for that, we can look into another smaller study called the CTOM 1104 on the survival data. We put it in ASCO this last year, Jafinib versus Venobrin for mutation positive patient in China. They had a positive progression-free survival, but then when you look at over survival, there's no significant difference, mostly due to the crossover. Now, can we automatically apply this data to the uh, to automated? I don't think so, because this is on first generation drug. The other one is on third generation drug and the duration of the TKI is also different. So potential impact, two questions. Should we still offer chemotherapy for a patient with each amputation positive or just go ahead and give them osimertinib? 
or should we wait for the overflow survival before we do that? Well, I think that, you know, we have to look at that the patient used the chemotherapy or not. Stage 1B, only 26% of them used the uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. 71 and 80% had used the adjuvant chemotherapy. So therefore, the data with stage 2 and 3, majority of the patient had actually used the chemotherapy. So the strongly positive data, a good number of patients, 70 80% of them, had actually got the chemotherapy uh, favorably. And so, but then when you look at a patient with adjuvant and without adjuvant, that doesn't seem to have any major difference. Patient with adjuvant chemotherapy, it seemed to be, you know, a significant more difference. But then it's due to the fact that the survival curve of the control arm is worse. Well, because we select the patient for adjuvant, so probably we select the worst patient, give them adjuvant chemotherapy, and without TKI, they actually perform worse. So it's very hard to based on this data to decide. But then the next question is that whether there is an impact on the outcome. Well, you can see that you know the hazard ratio is actually similar. Uh, however, but you know the the biology may be impacted. You can see that that the distant metastasis of semantinib is actually much less than the placebo group. And so is the so therefore, and also for the brain recurrence is much less in the oximetinib group. So in a way is that I think that chemotherapy can be optional, but for patients stage two and three, if the patient is physically well, I may still prefer to, for the patient to have it. And then on the over survival, the question is that we're not going to have over survival in three to five years. If positive, we have to give the alternative to all patients. But if negative, then we have to learn to select which is a support for patient that we want the reason. But the problem is that can we wait for the result? So if we, we, we just say a patient, you have it tomorrow, and then you did not give it. But three years later, if you get positive survival outcome, you cannot come back to give it back to the patient. So I think it's important to be able to explain to the patient and make the decision together with the patient on adjuvant estimate. So I managed to finish in 35 minutes. Sorry that I'm five minutes delay, but one last important breakthrough in 2020. Well, there's no other more important breakthrough in 2020 than the vaccine. And thanks to the Russia, you have the Sputnik V that is actually contributed to a lot of country as well. And certainly I would like to thank you all for the opportunity to uh, be in communication again. And I certainly would like to thank my friend for his hospitality in Fever Russia 2018. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you. very much thank you very much professor mok and it was a great presentation and uh now i would like to open the q a session and in fact uh, i want to tell to our audience that we decided to make this meeting in english because discussion with professor mok and uh the possibility to question professor mok is the uh, the unique thing of this meeting and uh, i uh try to encourage you to use it uh for the 100 percent so we have now for now one question from the audience and um it is uh, about the crown study uh what do you think uh that why intracranial duration of response curve looks much better than progression free curve for low uh what is the explanation for this do intracranial lesions respond better than extracranial to low yeah this this is a very good question but we we have to remember uh, there are two, two components to it. Number one, the sample size of the intracranial, pay, intracranial uh, disease is very small, okay? So when you try to compare the progression-free survival curve, the sample size will make a difference. When you look into a very small sample, it can always look good. So sample size is the one reason. Second, in the brain, there is also measurable disease and non-measurable disease. Uh, you have to be careful if you talk about the progression-free survival rate, then you have to talk about intracranial measurable disease, but we may not be talk covering the non-measurable disease. So I'm, and I cannot really conclude based on the crown data to say that the intracranial data is actually definitely better than the extracranial data. I think we may have to wait a little bit longer and also to observe uh, how the progression in the future before we can make that kind of judgment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We also have the raised hand from the audience, but we don't know what does that mean and how can we 
uh, take the, the question from the audience. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mok, for your great presentation. Now we see a lot of progress in the target therapy of uh, lung cancer. But uh, we, we understand that uh, target uh, uh, exists only not more than 30% of the patients. And most of the patients, more than 70%, have no targetable mesation. And the question concerns this uh, group of the patients. How many lines uh, of uh, chemotherapy uh, and immunotherapy do you uh, use uh, for the, this kind of patients in your practice? When you stop? because the problem of over treatment exists at least, at least in our center. Right. I think, again, a, a, a great question. Um, so, of course, we really have to judge according to the um, pd one status of the patient. Uh, and for patients with actually uh, uh, so-called the uh, with the high pd one expression, I commonly started with just immunotherapy. And then when they fail, I would change to chemotherapy plus or minus, most likely I may not continue uh, the immunotherapy. But when they fail again, that I may actually consider IMPA 150, which is chemo, uh, you know, like for example, if the patient had adenocarcinoma, uh, they pd one they fail, and then I give them ad, uh, a limb to carbo. When they fail, I may actually consider to give them taxo, carbo, avastin, and uh, adizozunumab. So in a way is that you probably have already about three lines of treatment available uh, for patient with the uh, patient over 50%. Now patient with uh, one to 49% is a little bit tricky uh, because the mechanism of resistance, you know, uh, is very diverse, you know, especially up the chemo IO that you don't know, know uh, what is the major mechanism. I personally do not give IO IO as a separate therapy because the experience have been quite negative. So that, that really a little bit restrict on your option, except by changing the, to different uh, to different uh, regimen. So, I, but then I think in the future we're likely going to have other uh, immune combination, and hopefully that will change our paradigm further. So remember, we only get immune therapy not too long ago, so we have to give some time for us to make the change uh, even better. Thank you, thank you. Uh, um... I, I, I do want to continue the question uh, about the ALK inhibitor. So uh, we have now uh, two second, two long-term second-gen uh, TKI. It's the uh, electnib and brigatnib, and one third-generation loletnib. Uh, but uh, we know from uh, from a flora trial from osimertinib in first line, when people start osimertinib, they feel great and uh, everything is fine and they tolerate the drug well. But when they treat, they're treated for a year and then for two years and somebody for uh, even more, uh, they be, start to notice that, for example, diarrhea grade two or grade one to two is not that good, is not that pleasant. For example, skin toxicity grade one is not also that, 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 that pleasant because patients cannot go to, uh, to the beach, to the uh, resorts uh, near the sea, uh, because they, are, uh, they have the skin problems. So uh, concerning the ALK inhibitor, what do you, uh, which of them do you think is the best from the uh, toxicity profile, meaning the long time use? Right. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, there is no comparative data on the long term usage. Uh, every patient can be different and uh, different population can also be a little bit different. So I think it's not fair to just say that, okay, one drug toxic profile is better than the other. I think they are different, okay? So for example, that you need to think about the uh, pneumonitis problem with the brigatinib. Serotinib, definitely there's a GI toxicity concern and anatinib, there's a liver enzyme uh, concern. So I think there are common, and for me, the key is not which drug, the key is which dose. So most of the toxicity that you experience are dose related. Uh, for example, anatinib, when you have 600 milligram, you know, it's common to have some edema, but absolutely there's no problem to reduce the dose to four, 450 or even 300, because there are data from J. Alec suggesting that low dose may still be effective. Similarly, for serotinib, most of patients cannot tolerate 750, that I, most of patients I gave is actually 450. And then similarly, for, for brigatinib, you can choice between 90 and 180 milligrams. Because this kind of drug is quite sensitive in inhibition. 
So I am quite comfortable to dose reduce to adjust the toxicity uh, and to, uh, to, 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 uh, to so-called to match to the patient rather than use the choice of drug to match to the patient. Thank you. Thank you. While there are uh, no questions from the audience, I will continue this, this discussion and ask the questions that I do have. So, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, we know that uh, it was uh, uh, you were the first author of the Fast Track 2 trial that was published uh, in 2015. And at that time, uh, already we knew that uh, ctDNA changes during the first periods of treatment are prognostic for the patient's survival. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, why are we still here? So we do not stratify patients based on baseline CT DNA, which is the marker of tumor burden. We do not uh, measure this. There are at least several prognostically different groups. Right. I mean, you're absolutely correct, but I think it's coming. The reason why it's not popularized is that we don't have the option of treatment, even though you got persistent DNA. Now you may say that, okay, uh, if I got persistent DNA, I'm going to add chemo or add anti-angiogenesis, but then there's no data to support that by adding it will make a difference. So we do need a prospective study to follow the DNA. If the DNA positive, then we randomize to a new treatment versus the standard, the single drug of TKI. Uh, there's a study called the Apple study from the URTC that's looking exactly on that. So I think the, it's, there's no doubt, it's not just the fast act 2 there are multiple different studies to show the same thing, but we just don't have the intervention that make the difference. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, and the next question is uh, that uh, when uh, it, it, it was also the, the work that was uh, that came from China and it was published in uh, two years ago, I think it was with uh, I with I con is mm. the uh, first gen uh, published in, in China and um, uh, it combined upfront uh, TGI with uh, uh, with radiotherapy for patients with oligometastatic mm. disease. And uh, the same paradigm was uh, challenged in uh, in this year with with osimertinib. What what do you think? Uh, is it uh, reasonable to uh, to uh, make this cytoreductive intervention, either surgery or radiotherapy, to decrease the tumor mass and increase probably the at least progression-free survival? Again, a, a great question. It's not just uh, not just uh, the osimertinib study from China published two years ago. There is a study called the Cinder study that was actually re reported the year before uh, from Sichuan that was also looking into patient with less than five uh, metastatic site. They had radiation plus gefitinib versus gefitinib, which also reported progression-free survival benefit. Now, uh, yes, it is attractive, uh, but then all these studies are limited by the fact that it is actually small sample size. And so uh, it, it will be very difficult uh, to use that and then so-called that to consider it as a standard. But I can share with you what I usually do. I actually do not, a uh, patient you know, with uh, actually the number of sites, I do not radiate all sites. But what I would do is that I would do a PET CT after three months of the TKI. If there's any residual active disease, I may consider it doing the irradiation of that area. So I, I don't think we can have a definitive, so-called uh, once and for all plan for the combination of radiation, but I do use a lot of local treatment for each application cause of lung cancer if they single site or one or two site are not behaving well. Great, thank you. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, Professor, the last question concerning the, the, uh, the uh, COVID infection. Uh, whether uh, any uh, relationship between the use of the target drugs uh, in lung cancer and uh, COVID infection? Are there any restrictions? Right. Uh, so far, there have been no specific restriction. The ASCO had already uh, put out some guideline, and then TKI has not been uh, considered to be a restriction. But then for patients with uh, immunotherapy or, uh, or, uh, or chemotherapy, uh, for patients with active COVID that they should not be uh, receiving it. So, uh, and also there's no higher incident of the so-called ILD that have been reported uh, with the COVID-19 so far. Yeah. So I think I really look forward to your talk, Feda, because uh, the time is running 
out. <laughs> so instead of you asking me a question, I actually rather listen to your talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, we have another question, but we will leave it for the uh, for the next session. Okay, so uh, thank you. Thank you. We are switching gears and I am uh, turning on my presentation. Uh, okay, and uh, uh, here am I. Uh, Okay, dear friends, uh, so uh, I'm very glad to participate in this meeting and it's a great honor for me to uh, share with you my thoughts about the advances in immunotherapy of non-small cell lung cancer. So uh, while Professor Mok uh, titled his talk Breakthrough, I uh, will speak about advances and uh, that was my idea, in fact, because I do think that we are now uh, between two waves, two waves of the uh, results of the trials uh, that uh, tells us about the use of immunotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, and uh, what is interesting is that uh, in 2018, uh, my scroller that don't work. Here I was. Mm -hmm. uh, we were uh, we were lucky to host uh, Professor Mok here in Saint Petersburg, and uh, the talk. Uh, Professor Smog gave at that time was called a bird eye view on IO. And it started with the, uh, with the column of numbers, which in fact uh, was the, uh, the, the names of the trials that, uh, were, uh, that uh, gave the first impression on uh, efficacy uh, of immunotherapy uh, we saw at that time. And what I've done, I've uh, updated this, uh, this slide with the data that we uh, do have uh, for this moment. And as you may have seen, uh, the, there is a very limited new data, but we have a lot of updates on the data uh, that, that uh, from the trials uh, reported and presented uh, in 2018 uh, by Professor Mock. What is important is that now we have a we have a clear separation. We have a clear separation of, of the patient based on uh, PDL1 expression. We have three groups of patient uh, of patients that did not uh, that were not treated before. Patient with high expression of PDL1 uh, uh, above 50%. Uh, patient with intermediate expression 1 to 49%, and about uh, patients uh, patients with negative ex expression. Uh, that those that have uh, negative PDL1 expression on the tumor cells. And what is important that during these years we developed uh, quite um, a good understanding of what to do with uh, or, and what is the role of immunotherapy for all these subtypes. Uh, interestingly that uh, 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 that uh, all these parts uh, of the non-small cell lung cancer they uh, are limited with about 30 percent of the patient and so uh, one third of the patient have different options. So I will start with the patient with the uh, category of 50% uh, and above. And uh, the uh, landmark trial for this uh, subgroup, in fact, the trial that um, make this separation of higher expressors uh, uh, important and uh, used in the clinical trial is the Keynote 024-4 uh, uh, trial. We have now the updated survival of the uh, of this uh, of this trial, and it compared the monotherapy with pembrolizumab with uh, chemotherapy in patients with high expression of PDL1. And we now know that uh, patients without activating mutations, patients with uh, non-small cell lung cancer, metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, can uh, live uh, with a median of uh, two years and have more than a year of uh, median progression-free survival without the use of. Uh, or chemotherapy with only first line uh, monotherapy with uh, with PD PD1 inhibitor, uh, which comes uh, during these years uh, was the uh, understanding that we are able to use not only pembrolizumab for this uh, type of patient, but we can use uh, the other drugs also. And the second uh, uh, the second uh, anti PDL1 uh, drug was atezolizumab, which uh, as a result of the Impower 110 study showed uh, that 
patient with high expression of PDL1 TC3 IC3 uh, because the um, PDL1 expression in this trial was estimated with the other uh, antibody uh, SP142 and it showed that uh, the same results at least for progression-free survival when we use monotherapy with uh, atezolizumab. Uh, the other option for the patients with, uh, uh, with, with the, for the higher expressors of PDL1 with the patients with expression of 50% and above is the use of uh, combination of chemo and uh, IO. And what is interesting, we have the updated uh, overall survival data for the two trials, uh, Keynote 024 and Keynote 189, which tells us that addition of chemotherapy did not any add anything to overall survival of the patients. You may see 26 uh, months medium for uh, monotherapy and 27 months medium for uh, combination of chemoimmunotherapy, while of course, chemoimmunotherapy is um, more toxic at, the, at least at the beginning. But uh, we also uh, noticed that uh, at least 20% of the of patients who received, uh, even with high expression of PDL1, who received monotherapy with uh, uh, monotherapy with PD1 inhibitor at the beginning or chemotherapy at the beginning, they suffer early progression, which uh, may. Uh, be called the primary resistance to uh, both of this um uh, to both of these types of treatment. But what is interesting is that these uh, resistance mechanisms, they are not, in, not intercalating. And uh, the data from a Keynote 189 shows us that uh, if we use the combination of chemo IO, we do not see such progression, uh, such um, primary progression uh, in, uh, right in the beginning of the treatment. Uh, but unfortunately, that are not all the uh, results we understand and not, not the all uh, ideas we've got uh, during these years. Uh, two years ago, Professor Mock presented at ASMO the result, final overall results for Keynote uh, 042, the trial that included uh, PDL1 positive patients who was, uh, who was stratified based on uh, PDL1 expression and also uh, uh, received monotherapy. And this trial uh, also included patients with uh, high expression of PDL1. But what is interesting, of course, we cannot make uh, the cross trial comparison because it's not fair. And uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot understand whether what, what is the reason for this? And I hope that Professor Mok will comment on that. But still, in uh, the cohort of patients with high expression of PDL1 in uh, Keynote 042 trial, the results for overall, for overall survival were worse than we saw in a Keynote 024 trial. So, uh, where is the the, uh, the truth? What should we expect when we start treating patients with a monotherapy uh, of the high expressor? Uh, we are still uh, awaiting to know. Uh, the next group of patients is uh, the cohort with the intermediate expression from 1 to 49%. And the landmark treatment for this patient during the last, the previous years is the combination of uh, uh, chemo and IO. And we have the updates of uh, on, on the oral survival, and they are good even for this uh, intermediately sensitive to immunotherapy subgroup, 1 to 49%. Uh, so we, we do see that the results in terms of overall survival and progression-free survival are not that bad. But what is interesting is uh, that uh, during the years, uh, we see the change in the results which were presented, for example, in 2018 and 2020. Uh, at that time, two years ago, we were uh, hoping to see the tail of the curve when we waited uh, for it uh, to for the patient for the long term survival, but unfortunately for uh, the combination of uh, chemoimmunotherapy, uh, it was not the truth because we saw that the patient continued to progress uh, with the duration of, of time. And here I want to return to the very interesting data we saw in Keynote 042 trial. Uh, because irrespectively of the PDL1 expression, either it is high uh, above 50%, either it is, in, it is intermediate or high above 20%, or it might be uh, above 1%, or intermediate from 1 to 49%, it does not affect uh, the duration of response. If patients respond to monotherapy, uh, then it lasts longer, it lasts about uh, with the median of 20 months. 
and it is not the case for uh, chemoimmunotherapy. The results of uh, uh, of 189 of keynote 189 showed that depending on uh, pdl one expression, we saw a slight decrease in the duration of response, which meant that there is a population uh, who, uh, of patients who do not respond to immunotherapy, but respond to chemotherapy. And the duration of response for chemotherapy uh, is characterized by uh, not being that long. Uh, so uh, during these years, we have got another fascinating data, and um, I will return to this in the discussion uh, because uh, we are very intrigued, intrigued to know uh, what about uh, what, what Professor Mock thinks about the uh, place of the combination uh, in uh, the new data on the combination uh, in the treatment of intermediate or uh, poor uh, expression, express. So we've got the data, the results from two trials, ch uh, checkmate uh, to, to uh, 7 and 9, uh, 9LA, which uh, tells us the role of the combination of ipilimumab and nivolum nivolumab uh, plus or minus uh, two cycles of chemotherapy in patients with uh, PDL1 positive or uh, PDL1 respective uh, cohorts. And what is interesting is the duration of the response uh, in these two trials. And uh, uh, on, the, on the left panel, you may see the duration of response in chemo uh, IO uh, trial, 9LA, and on the right panel, uh, the just uh, the IO combination. And you may see that while in the IO combination, if patient responds, then response lasts longer. Uh, there is not the case for a chemo IO combination. Even two cycles of chemotherapy, uh, for example, uh, cannot uh, create the response that will last uh, at least uh, 12 months or 24 months, and we see the decrease yeah, and progression in uh, patients. Still, the results of the uh, IO combination and chemo IO combinations uh, in terms of overall survival are comparable uh, at two years, and we are waiting for the longer results. Uh, besides this, uh, the, I think that the uh, results that our patients are uh, waiting for from us is the uh, results see, uh, uh, that we can see on this uh, graph. The patients want to live longer, to live, to receive uh, the uh, drug, and after that, don't uh, do not uh, have the progression of the disease. And I think that uh, we are awaiting for the newer drugs, awaiting for the newer results, awaiting for the newer methods that will allow us uh, to discriminate patients that respond to immunotherapy or who do not respond to immunotherapy early in order to uh, make the correct treatment. And the last group of patients that uh, in fact have uh, a very little number of patients that are sensitive to immunotherapy is the group with uh, uh, expression of uh, below 1% or negative expression. And here we uh, combine the data uh, on this subgroup of this uh, PDL1 negative subgroup uh, derived from different trials. And you may see that uh, there is no such great benefit from uh, IO for uh, this subgroup of patients. Still, it is in many, uh, many regimens, for example, the regimen that we derived from Checkmate 9 LA, LA uh, trial, they are registered, for example, in Russia, it's the only for double uh, combination for double IO uh, that is registered in our country. Still, they are reasonable for the patient with uh, PDL1 negative stat status, and they can lead to the uh, increment in overall survival. And for example, uh, this, uh, for, uh, we think that uh, the, it is probably the place for, uh, for the IO combinations. Those patients who do not have PDL1 expression, probably they were smokers and active smokers, and uh, probably this patient might derive the biggest benefit from uh, IO combination with two cycles of chemotherapy. And I want to uh, finish my talk with uh, our data. Uh, during this pan pandemic, we were uh, we had enough time uh, to uh, to combine the data uh, we have in our center and. 
so uh, we analyzed the real life, real uh, clinical results of the treatment of patients with non-small cell lung cancer with uh, immunotherapy. That was quite a new type of treatment uh, during the previous two years. And uh, as you may have seen, uh, the uh, this uh, this results tells us that uh, either you use IO in the first line or in the second line, uh, it of course brings to the uh, significant improvement in overall survival. But still, in Russia, we, despite the fact that we have a lot of oil and gas, uh, we still do have the problem of uh, money and the problem of uh, funds that we uh, should spend on uh, treatment. Because for our country, either type of immunotherapy, either type of uh, targeted therapy is too expensive for the vast majority of uh, the population uh, to be paid out of pocket or even to be uh, co-funded, uh, for example, 20 or 10 or 10 percent that is done, for example, in the United States. And this graph represents the, uh, the results, the uh, comparison of the results uh, in terms of uh, overall response rate, uh, six-month progression-free survival, one-year survival, and the price, the mean price of this uh, of this uh, drug. And unfortunately, for our country, this graph tells us that. Uh, we will not be able to cover all the patients with in the nearest future with these expensive drugs. And unfortunately, this um, brings us to the idea that we should uh, we should decide who is the first to receive this drug. I mean, in terms of efficacy, in terms of uh, the duration of response. And I hope that uh, Professor Mok will comment on that and um, might uh, influence our decision on this. I. Uh, finish my talk, and uh, I think we will, that we will start the Q and A session. Thank you. Fantastic! I'm back. <laughs> so yes, I finished the so demonstration. May, maybe you can actually have your Russian colleague to ask questions in Russia, and then you just do a bit of translation that both you and I can contribute to to to, to the idea. Uh, yes, we have one more question, and in fact, it's uh, to uh, your talk about uh, about the uh, genomic tests. So, how do you see the role of genomic uh, of complex genomic profiling, uh, for example, uh, Foundation One or Sonomics, in clinical trials and in general in, diag in diagnostic and further treatment of lung cancer today, uh, in comparison with traditional single methods and approaches? Right. I, th I think this is a very important question. So I have to put into the economic context, as you are highlighted in Russia or even in Asia, not every patient can afford it. So we should not do the test on every patient. However, for non-smoker who are adeno with adenocarcinoma, who are EGFR and ALK or ROS1 negative, I think we really own it to them to do the testing. For example, I just tested a lady that was a traditional with her stage four disease, EGFR, ALK, ROS1 negative. But then the sample is not good enough. So I actually re -bopsy her, you know, instead of the lung, I re -bopsy her nymph node and then do the uh, synomic uncle snap pro. Ho behold, she is red positive. And then with the red positive, you know, her median progression free survival is going to be very good. So without knowing it, her, her pathway is going to be chemo, chemo IO, and probably may not be as good as being able to find the red. So I think that is one group, at least we only to them. If you get a heavy smoker, uh, you know, then you don't do molecular testing. I don't think you're going to miss too much. But then for non-smoker, I think that that's one group that we really have to do it. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my question is, what is your favorite combination after uh, progressing on the semertinib or Vazotinib, for example, when the patient uh, progresses? Right. So for osimertinib failure, what I actually like to do if the patient can afford it is to re -bopsy. Now, right now we have the resistant mechanism of a MAC amplification, about 20%. We also had about 10-15% uh, on the C797S. And also we have some HER2 overexpression. So for MAC, actually we can do something by combining EGFR and TKI MAC inhibitor. I have seen some dramatic responses. So I think there's one good direction uh, if we can find and afford another molecular target in this space. If not, uh, my standard is still chemotherapy. 
And only if chemotherapy fail, then I may give chemo IO. Right now, second line chemo IO is under investigation. So I, I probably would just go on with just chemotherapy alone, you know. And then I still got response rate of 30%. Okay. Uh, so no question from the audience. Okay, okay. Can I ask the, the question concerning the duration of uh, immunotherapy? This is a question to both of you. Uh, we, we will know uh, from, from the... Uh, uh, clinical trials, the first line clinical, uh, first uh, phase one clinical trials in melanoma, when uh, first uh, used the combination of nivolumab uh, and ipilimumab, the response, complete response, uh, EP already after three weeks of the treatment. Our recommendation is to treat longer, and everybody understands that the pharmaceutical company is inter interested to, to, to treat forever. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Practical, on pra practical point of view, when to stop the treatment? Okay. Uh, uh, if we achieve complete response, uh, if we achieve uh, a partial response, because some of the patients we have uh, in our center, they, they say that they are already tired uh, to, uh, they, they achieve complete res uh, partial response and it's prolonged more than for two years. Yep. Whether to I stop the treatment or uh, just uh, prolong uh, for toxicity or uh, PD. Yeah, I, I agree entirely with you that the duration is a key issue. So according to the Kinox 024 and 042, the duration is two years. Okay, so basically if you got partial response, uh, CRPR or the stable disease, then you should keep on the drug for two years. However, this is one thing I do. I actually give less frequently. So, you know, in a way is that with the patient doing really well, instead of every three weeks, I give every four weeks, every five weeks. And then a lot of my patients still do well, I and mean, they save them a lot of money as well. So the duration recommended is two years, which I kind of tend to adhere because that's what clinical trial have done. And also in the most recent update uh, of the 024 data that was just come out in ESCO, uh, uh, in ESCO this year, uh, last year, that the patient who stop at two years, even when they recur, you can re-challenge them and you still have about 30% response rate. So I think I would keep ceiling at two years, but I would reduce the frequency if there's a concern uh, or tiredness of receiving the drug. Uh, and we have the question from the audience. So uh, the question is about how comfortable you feel with PDL1 expression and with determining the treatment approach with uh, with uh, PDL1 expression because those patients that do have high expression they receive monotherapy, and uh, we can also use them chemo IO, but in, in, we are not so uh, happy with that. We, uh, we, we don't use it. So how comfortable are you with this biomarker? That of course yeah. is not that so. Precise. So the biomarker of cut off fifty percent was done in a very nice paper by Edgar Ron in New England Medicine in two thousand sixteen. Uh, so it's quite reliable in a way is that they base this cutoff at about 500 patients using 180 patients as a testing and about 340 patients as a validation. So I think the 50% cutoff is reasonable, not ideal, but it's a reasonable cutoff. So I think right now for clinical purpose, I will use 50%. In the future, there's a few things that I may see in the future. One is the tumor, is, one is the uh, uh, so-called the uh, tumor infiltrate lymphocyte, TU. And right now it's very difficult for the pathologist to look at TU. But in the future, not too distant future, use of AI will help the pathologist to look for the TU. I think TU makes sense because TU is a reflection of how much TU, uh, lymphocyte can infiltrate to the tumor. And that is the one that's cytotoxic. So I think that you know, in the future, there will be a so-called companion uh, together with the TIL that may help us to assist even better refine, uh, define the pdl one status. So I think start off at cornerstone with pdl one but I think in the future, we may add on extra biomarker to the pdl one to tell us the, the guidance. Uh, thank you. We don't have uh, further questions, but then my, my, my last question. For, I have one question for you. Why okay. do you look younger than the two years ago? And you, you lost weight and you look younger. What happened to you? <laughs> just, just, I lost, just lost weight. <laughs> so, <that's laughs> the, uh, so the last question, what is going to be next? What, what uh, is the future? 
I feel, um, I think there's two things I think are coming up. The ADC is going to play a major role. I mean, you now see the data I show you on ADC on HER2 and on the EGFL, but I think there is a HER2, there's an ADC on uh, TROP3. And TROP3 is a lot more common uh, than HER2. So I've, I've, I'm sorry, TROP2. So I think the anti TROP2. Uh, ADC is likely going to come to the clinic uh, in the near future. So look out for ADC. It may potentially replace some of the cytotoxic chemotherapy, number one. Second, I think there's a lot of work on cellular cell therapy now. CAR-T uh, uh, and also the, the use of CRISPR. Uh, you know, so there will be cell therapy that's coming up to the lung cancer. And on immunotherapy front, there's a number of things. Uh, the anti-ticket is coming in, and there's additional uh, other immune drug that will be coming in, like the CD47. So, so there will be along the line of new immune drug, uh, ADC, and cell therapy. It's going to keep you busy for the next 10 years. Great. Thank you. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, 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 Professor Mok and uh, Professor Moiseenko for your excellent presentation. And uh, I'm impressed uh, with the discussion. I, I hope that it will be very interesting also for audience. And мне хотелось бы, чтобы была обратная связь, коллеги. Устраивает ли вас такая форма проведения проведения школы? Полезна ли она в практическом отношении? И э, на этом позвольте закончить. Всем спасибо большое и надеюсь, так сказать, услышать от вас ответ. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Bye -bye. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. 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 B